Okay, uh, good morning everyone. So last time that uh, we have uh, discussed about how we can try to define the different latest cell. So last time we have mentioned that uh, one is called the unicell and one is called the uh, pre-military cell here. So we can use this vector to represent the any place inside of the, this uh, lattice crystal structure. And also we have already discussed that there's a three uh, most common uh, lattice structures in the, in the semiconductor. So the first mm -hmm. one is uh, the simple cubic. So the simple cubic is the uh, one that we have the, the, this crystal in the, each corner of this uh, lattice. And then in this way, we have the A corner and each one only have the one over A. So then the total number of atoms per unit cell, which is equal to one. So that's the case for the simple cubic. And then also we have the case for the body central cubic here. So in the case of the body central, that also we have the A in the corner, but also we have the one in the center. So the number of atoms inside this unicell, which will be this plus additional one, because we have a one in the center. This is also, we call this as a BCC. And also there's another one called the face central cubic. So as shown me here, we still have the eight in the corner. And besides of this eight, we have the six in the each face here. So then inside, if we have the crystal in the face, then that's a, each one will only contribute for the half to the, the number of atoms. So therefore, in total, the, the number of atoms inside of FCC, which will be, the total will be equal to the four. So that's a, a very basic calculation, but we can start to see that uh, how that the atoms with respect to the different kind of the latest arrangement. Okay, so this is what we have already discussed. In the case of a simple cubic here, we have one over A for the points per corner times we have A corner. So then in the end, it's one point per cell here. And if we consider number of density, then we should consider the this of the the volume. So this is one over a three, which will be a number of density. In the case of a simple cubic. Also the same. Uh, we we consider this one is a, a BCC, which is a, we have a one in the uh uh center and then the eight in the corner. So we have a one in the center, eight in the corner. Then in this case, we have a one over eight times A inside as a corner and the one in the inside. And then so the total number per cell will be equal to two. And also in the case of the FCC, here, so we have the eight in the corner, and now we have a, a six in the face. So in the end, we have a four. So that's a, a basic, but it's very important as as long as uh, the later on, if we need to have a certain of the uh, uh, latest uh, analysis, usually we will refer to these uh, different crystal uh, arrangement. So in the case of a silicon and germanium, so that's a, it's based on the diamond cubic structure. And then in the case of a diamond cubic structure, which is the two face central cubic sublattice. So we have the two FCC sublattice, and then the, each one will be shift along the body diagonal by one over four cubic edge. 
So you have a, a two uh, FCC, but each one will be shift along our the, the body diagonal for the one over four QB edge, and this will be the typical the the diamond structure that for the case of silicon and germanium. Now we have to think uh think about how to define the 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 plane inside of this uh, crystal here. So then we come up with uh, the definition of what we call the Miller index. So as we have been shown that if we have this this kind of the crystal structure, this is typical cubic. How do we define, for example, this plane? What the possible uh, methodology we can have a way to call out this plan, or how do we call out this plan? So we need to find out the way to define this plan. So this is how we call this as a Miller index. So the basically the idea, the Miller index, is to describe the lattice direction and plan. So our idea is trying to have the way that come out to tell us that uh, what's the name of this plan and what's the uh, name of these directions. Mm -hmm. So the procedure is pretty simple. First one, we intercept in the x, y, and z axis with a, a unit latest constant. So in this case, if we want to define this plan, and then we have the three along this axis, and then two along this axis, and then we have a one along this axis. This is because of this one, this is three, two, one. So first of all, we found out that the intercept between the x, y, and z axis. In this case, this is x, uh, I think this is x, y, and z. Intercept, which means the jieju. So let's find out the, the jieju along the x, y, and z axis with considering a unit, a latest constant. And then we have the reciprocal of the inter steps and multiple by the lowest common denominator so reciprocal means uh, dao su so we put uh, this as a reciprocal of the intercept and then we multiply the uh, lowest uh, common denominator so in this case Uh, the first one that how we define is a 3, 2, 1. And then the reciprocal will be 1 over 3, mm -hmm. 1 over 2, and 1 over 1. And then we times the uh, uh, lowest common denominator, so which will be the 6. So if we times 6, in the end will be equal to 2, 3, 6. And therefore, the plan referring to this one is what we call the 236 okay so that's how we call this plan actually it's called the 236 plan here so this is also the uh, the same uh, description here so First of all, we find out that the intercept, the plan corresponding, that would be equal to 3, 2, 1. And then we write the reciprocals of this intercept, which will be equal to 1 over 3, 1 over 2, and 1 over 1. And then now the lowest common denominator, which will be equal to 6. So once we times this 6, that will be equal to 2, 3, 6. And therefore, the plan referred to here will be equal to, that's how we call this plan, which is a 236 plan. So the calculation is very simple. That's uh, just, uh, I think this is the elementary level of the mathematics 
and then but the concept here is uh, pretty useful because later on we will need this one to uh, uh, define the different plane inside of the crystal. So here are some of more like the cases here. So we will use because of the, of course the the plan we are interested in is just not as simple as we have been shown. Sometimes there's a, some a special case. For example, the first one, the negative intercept here. So we are also interested in the case of uh, this one. The this is two and this is three. This two and this is three, and then, however, the plane in the z axis which will be equal to minus two, so therefore we are interested in this plane. So first of all, still the same. This is uh, two three uh, minus two, the intercept in the each axis, and then we do the reciprocal, so which will be one over two, one over three and 1 over minus 2 and still the same we multiply by the lowest common denominator which will be the 3 2 minus 3 here but uh, however in this case as uh, we don't know actually this is a negative in the uh, z axis yeah this will be going to be confused with a typical case in the positive z axis therefore we will put a small head three two minus three but we will put a small head on top of this one to differentiate between the positive and negative directions so in this case in the future once you see there's a small head on top of the certain uh, uh, intercept and that means in that case we have a negative uh, direction compared to the positive okay and another one is sometimes we also interested in the intercept in the infinity like in this case in this case so the x intercept will be equal to 2 the y intercept will be equal to 3 but however, we are actually interested in the this plane along the infinity. So there's no intersections between the plane and then the z axis. So then in this case, we are interested in the the plane that uh, uh, approach to the infinity. But in the case of the the Miller index, still we are possible to define this plane. So as usual, the first one the intercept in the each uh, axis which will be 2, 3 and infinity and we do the reciprocal so that will be 1 over 2 1 over 3 and 1 over the infinity and then once we multiply the lowest uh, common denominator which will be equal to 3, 2 and 0 Right, so 1 over infinity which will be equal to 0 and therefore the plan we are interested in here which will be equal to 3, 2, 0 so therefore once in the future you see that there's a, a 0 inside of the Miller index that means we are interested in the plan that along that axis is approached to the infinity here Okay. So in general, the the middle index is quite uh, simple. It's very straightforward. Just uh, consider the one over uh, uh, reciprocal of the intercept, and then you can easily to have the result come out. Of course, there are some more rules about the middle index because we are not only deal with deal with uh, one. Uh, plan. Sometimes we are interested in the family of the plan, or we are interested in the direction of that plan. So the first case is uh, what we have been discussed. 
if we have the negative intercept in the x-axis so then you will see the small head on top of the uh, uh, number of the other axis so we will have the small head here and then if you see this style of the bracket here so that means we are considering the family of the plants here so we are not only indicate of only we are only point point out for the one plant we are actually point out for the family of the plant so for example this is a family of a plant so family of plant for one zero zero considering all these and also the negative part that's all include the family of the plant and if we see this kind of a bracket that means we present a direction this means this uh, direction direction of the plan and also if we see this one this style of the bracket that means this is a family of the direction here so in general we just uh, change the style of the bracket and then that just has a little bit different of the definition and sometimes that uh, this uh, small definition that can be also useful in the later on we will show that uh, there's a uh, this old uh, very old knowledge this has this knowledge has been uh, developed and has been lectured in the many many years but still right now that's still many really useful so later on we will read uh, one paper advanced paper just published recently that is still we need this of the middle index to help us to define the plan here okay so this is a very standard case in the case we want to see this is a this is a plan of one zero zero and then the direction of that plan is here so this is the direction of that plan so then we just change the bracket then we can represent the direction of the plan and also the same this is a plan for one one zero and then still this is a direction of this plan this is a one one zero and this is a plan for one 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 and the direction will be here okay so that's a, a very uh, I believe this is very straightforward to be understood okay so let's move on so then the next one we could discuss is for the uh, discussion for the bonding so inside of the semiconductor or the crystal actually there's a different way of the bonding so the first one is ionic and the second one is covalent and the third one is a metallic and also we have the van der Waals bonding these are actually all come from the chemistry so i believe everyone who are here should at least learn the chemistry either as you uh, still as a fresh student in the college or when you still the high school student i believe everyone that should have at least under a little bit exposed to the chemistry then in that chemistry we discuss a lot about the, the bondings in here we only take the most important parts related to us so we will not go through the detail just uh, quickly go through the text so the ionic bonding is a typical chemical bond that involves the electrostatic attraction between the op opposite charged ions so in the crystal the negative charged ions tend to be surrounded by the positive charged ions so we have the positive and negative that would be uh, attracted to each other so then we can form this as a, a bonding so you can see that this uh, sodium and then this chrome are all turns here and then the the uh, outside of the sodium we have the positive charge 
and then the outside of the chrome we have the negative charge here so in the end based on this positive and negative uh, attraction so we can form the bonding here so that's an ionic bonding and next one that's related to the the covalent bonding so covalent bonding results in the electrons being shared between the atoms. It's an electron share between the atoms, so the effect of a valence energy share of the each atom is full. The covalent bonding is the one that we are most interested in because in the case of a semiconductor, most of the case we are discussing the covalent bonding, which is a gong jia jie. So actually, in this case, the silicon is a, a ideal case for the covalent bonding. So the outside of the silicon, we have the four electrons in the out, outer shell. So this has a four electron and this has a four electrons here. So we have one, two, three, four, four electrons in the outer shell. And also, in the case, we have four electrons in the outer shell for the typical because the, the silicon is a group four, right? So group four, definition of group four means that we have the four electrons in the outer shell. And then once we put together of the silicon and silicon that comes to close to each other, therefore we have the two electrons will be four and that is a covalent bonding. This one, this one, and this one. So these are the covalent bonding. So I think that's a, a pretty basic in the case of the chemistry. So in the case of the semiconductor right now, it's a really like a multi-discipline uh, a background, like a professional field. That means that uh, we are actually not only in the Maybe like the 10 years ago, when I was still, still the student, as being like an electrical engineering student, the semiconductor is mainly uh, limited by the double E student who, can, who will uh, actually have a chance to learn. Because in that case, that uh, is still mainly under the double E program, like uh, electrical engineering or electronics engineering. But now that because of the semiconductor involves in the different expertise, not only for the electrical engineering, sometimes we need to have the physics inside. So that's why we learn the semiconductor physics. But also in the case of the bonding, especially we go into the, the Alton scale, like the Antron scale or the Micron scale, sometimes the, the material science and chemistry that also need to be involved. And also that we, with uh, respect to the sound of the semiconductor uh, uh, equipment uh, developed, that as you may know, that we all need some very advanced uh, semiconductor equipment, and therefore the mechanical engineers are also needed because we need the leverage of lost know-how here. So in general, I think this is a multidiscipline uh, uh, field that uh, is all welcome. The, the student, as long as you are interested in the engineering, that is, I think there's no specific like the barrier that uh, stop you, that everyone is really welcome. Okay, so this is for covalent bonding. And then for the metallic bonding, just uh, related to the metal, so we will quickly uh, go through. So this is a positive metallic ions as being surrounded by the sea of the negative electrons and then solely being held together by the electron stative force. So that's a basic definition for the metallic bonding. And we also have the van der Waal bonds here. So it's caused by the correlation in the polarization of the nearby particles here. So we won't talk about the van der Waal here because that's really special case, but in the, some of the advanced material system for the semiconductor like the 2D system, Sometimes they will discuss for the van der Waals bonds. 
Okay, so inside of the crystal system, we also need to understand that there's some non-ideal case. So what we discussed before is all are ideal. So the crystal arrangement is perfect. Every every crystal is perfectly on its own ideal place. But however, in reality, that there are many many imperfections and impurities in the solids. Imperfection, impurity. It means that sometimes there's a additional stuff, or sometimes we lack some of the stuff, and then that creates a certain of the imperfections. This right now is super important later on for the advanced technology, because right now we are try to use many many different material system, and the different material system is not easy to make sure that the, the lattice inside is perfect. So we face a lots of challenge of the imperfection and impurity. The first one I want to discuss is what we call the the vacancy. So if you look at for the typical lattice arrangement, so in the case we have the. The crystal, the open sitting here, here, here. So this is what we wish to have: that the each the open is perfectly sitting in the its own ideal place. But however, sometimes we found out that the, there's a one place is missing a open. This one is missing, so. And then, if there is a one missing open in a certain place, therefore we call this as a vacancy. Vacancy. Yes. Yeah, so, if there is a one, the open is missing, and therefore we create the empty place layer, and that's usually we call the vacancy. Ah.、Uh, Vacancy is a interesting word, not only used in the semiconductor, but also the the another uh uh cases that you will might be used in the future is when you look for the job. Sometimes when we look for a job, you check with someone. You say that does there any job vacancy? Job vacancy means that you uh you 没有任何职缺 So. Actually, the vacancy just、uh, means an empty place. So, not only in the semi in semiconductor. Actually, uh, you need to Google. I don't know how to translate in the case of the a、uh, vacancy in Chinese as we talk about the semiconductor. Uh, because we all sometimes we just call this as a vacancy. But when you look for the job, sometimes we say that the、uh, do you have any job vacancy? That means、uh, you are actually asking that.、Uh, You have no any vacancy. So the vacancy is anyway just means as an empty place, and then this empty place means that some sometimes something can be filled in. So this is a vacancy. That's a problem of the imperfections. Another one is what we call the interstitials. So which means you we have the open in the place that some. The place that we don't want is the open is in the wrong place, and this is what we call the interstitials. So, in general, the vacancy in real crystal, there's an open may be missing from the particular. Latest sign, so that's why we refer to this as a vacant. So we have open missing layer. Another one is called the interstitial. Interstitial is means that a open may be located between the latest sign. It just actually the open located in the place that we don't want it. So that's how we call this as a interstitial. And how this actually influence the device property later. Because of,、uh, imagine that you have a vacancy here, so therefore, it's probably during the device operation, 
some of the additional autons might come in, but these autons not actually belong to this system. For example, if we have additional electrons, will probably come in to this vacancy. And when he come in here, he will temporarily stay here for a while, but it's not permanent because they are uh, someone from somebody else, just like the in this uh, uh, sometimes uh, the maybe uh, uh, you have a one seat and then you have some other people will temporarily sit in that seat, but they also will live for the while here. So these electrons might have the chance to temporarily sit in here, but after the moment, this electron will also go away and that's actually become the problem for our semiconductor device. The real name of this case is what we call the trapping effects. And the trapping effect will create the instability for our device. So that's related to the reliability issue. So the trapping, uh, uh, trapping in Chinese, I think it means that the uh, it's kind of like the electron trapping. Sometimes we say the electron trapping means that the 电子被这个缺陷抓住, trap is a, 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 a word that uh, sometimes describes the, the uh, that's, uh, that's how we translate it. There's no better translation. So trapping generally like the xianjin. So which means that you once you have vacancy, you create the trapping site. So this electron will get trapped by this vacancy for some time. But after certain later, it will also uh, uh, go away again. So once it goes away, it's what we call the, the detrapping. So this is just a, a preliminary knowledge to show to everyone that uh, uh, there's uh, some further uh, implication based on knowledge of the, the imperfection and impurities here. So this is two-dimensional representation of the single crystal showing there's a one, what we call the vacancy defect, or another one is called the interstitial de defect here. We won't spend too much time in this class to discuss for the trapping issues that's related to reliability that uh, in my another class we talk a lot for reliability issue but in here it's more fundamental for the uh, semiconductor but it's good that it let you know that uh, this one this small defect small vacancy in the future create a huge impact because uh, there's uh, many many people who whole his life just working on trying to remove of this vacancy for their uh, during their whole career also there's not only this kind of a vacancy or the interstitials the defect we also sometimes have the line defect which means that the, the defect is not only have the one open it's the defect is uh, uh, along with one line so you can see that, that there's a entire row of the altar is missing so in the case here, there's an entire row of the uh, missing. This is a general case that we also see in the semiconductor very often. So this is how we call this as a line defect. And this is often happened to the case where we have the heat draw structure. The heterosexual structure or hetero semiconductor it means that we have the two different semiconductor material for the by using the certain of the methodology we put a one semiconductor on top of the another semiconductor. So in this case it's very similar. For example, this can be the typical silicon semiconductor. And then if we try to grow another material. For example, the gallium nitride. So if you try to grow the gallium nitride on top of the silicon, and then the problem will be because of everything between the silicon and gallium nitride is completely different. For example, the band gap, 
for example the latest constant for example even for the the crystal orientation so silicon is what we call the cubic but the gallium nitride is what we call the wuzi which is a hexagonal it's a liu jiao xin the jin ti and silicon is a zhen fang ti so however we try to put the, these two semiconductors together it's always easily has a problem that uh, there will be the some open missing and thus create the line defect and this defect can be only happen here or sometimes this defect can be grow up as long as we put the uh, as long as uh, the, the, the the semiconductor is growing secret so that's always the issues okay so also there's also another one it's called uh, the substitutional so in the case the previous one is called the imperfections this is many imperfection imperfection means that uh, it's itself imperfect but sometimes we have uh, something come out from on the outside that's how we call this as uh, impurity so impurity still the same so impurity can be uh, uh open located in normal lattice site but uh, they are actually come from the different uh, uh material and that's how we call the substitutional impurity here so in this case we have the two different kind of impurity so still the same if you are considering the silicon For the silicon case, we have the autons here, autons here, autons here, autons here, autons here, here. But suddenly, due to the unknown reason, there's other autons come in, for example, and then sitting here. And this is how we call the impurity. And this one can be the other species, for example, the phosphorus that can be also for somehow reason coming and sitting inside and that's how we call the the the, the impurity or another mm. boron coming and sitting in the place not in the normal uh, uh latest side here that's also can be possible so this is a one which show me here substitutional impurity so once there is a uh, impurity open come in and substitutional for the original uh, alters and that's how we call it substitutional impurity or this one is called the interstitial impurity that is this one so in this figure is uh, also the nice drawing that uh, this one is for the substitutional impurity and this one is called the interstitial impurities okay so one more is one to show me that what we discussed for the miller index that's pretty old knowledge right that's uh the just a uh, beginning of the semiconductor physics but that knowledge is already useful later on for you that when you read the paper this is just a paper showing that uh, even this small very easy knowledge is already quite useful might be helpful for you for the future research mm -hmm. and then this is a paper just want to show uh, the title is a performance dependency of the CMOS on silicon substrate orientation so because this paper is discussed for the orientation. What does it mean orientation? The crystal uh, direction is kind of orientation. Orientation for the ultra thin oxide nitride and hafnium oxide gate dielectric here. So since this is just uh, the third process of this for this semester, I believe right now if you already review what we have been discussed before then some of the keyword here might not be uh, unfamiliar with you you might be already familiar because what we already said before 
what is a CMOS. We have uh, briefly introduced what is CMOS. For sure, later on, we will talk about later. And also, we already mentioned uh, why do we need to have the gate directory, because the gate directory is a crucial part for the MOSFET. So in this paper, the abstract showing that there's a certain keywords that you might be actually start to feel that the why do we need to learn from the Miller index? Because in the abstract, you already mentioned the dependency of a CMOD performance on sequence crystal orientation of 100, 111, and 110. So that's exactly what we have been talking about. So we spend this a little bit time to explain that the, what does Miller index. Now you can see that the Miller index is also useful. It's just beyond only the number of the the crystal plan is really useful later on because in this paper we have discussed that the, when we try to fabricate the device on the different silicon crystal orientation and how that actually the crystal orientation will influence our device characteristic and of course we need to tell the people what's the orientation we are working on so therefore we need to consider this middle index here so in this case, they say that uh, blah, 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 and then we have a Harfonian gate directory on the 111-110 service, and then compared to the 100. So now I believe you have a certain of idea what is actually the 110 and 100. And then the CMOS driving current is nearly symmetric on 110 again. So all these papers is only all about the 111-110 is all about the crystal orientation. Since we have already discussed a little bit about the, the paper, so it's good to show that uh, how actually can quickly and be helpful for you to quickly understand that uh, how that uh, how do we read the paper in a more efficient way. Because uh, this is when we try to organize a paper, when we try to write or read a paper, you first have to understand that uh, we always the uh, academic paper, especially for the engineering, we use a uh, straightforward to write it. Straightforward means that uh, in the Chinese, when we learn the how to write article, it's similar to the Kaiman Jian San Fa. So in this case, we put all these conclusion or all these highlight as easy understood as possible. So therefore, usually in the abstract and summary, just almost contains every uh, key idea. So if you don't have time, then usually you won't have to go through the detail. You read the abstract and summary, that supposed already give you more than 80% of the knowledge inside. And when we write papers, sometimes just need the concept of refresh. For example, this is a title. And usually the title are very similar to the first sentence. So if you look at the first sentence, dependency of Simon performance on silicon crystal orientation on 100 has been investigated with a equilibrium gate diagnostic less than 3 nanometer. So to be honest, this sentence is ideally almost the same. The message, what they want to deliver, is exactly the same like the title here. Because they just say that uh, in this paper, we're working on the dependency modes on the different crystal with uh, less than three nanometer. And this sentence sometimes also will be identical to the first sentence of the summary. So if you look at the summary, it's still the same. Electron homomorphism has been measured in CMOS device on second substrate with different crystal orientation. So the same keywords always come out. You can see this one. Crystal orientation. This is also the crystal orientation. And this is orientation. So this basically what they talk about is almost the same thing. So you have a CMOS. You have a CMOS, you have a CMOS. So then, when you start in the future, I believe that uh, one of you might have uh, some chance to write it down for the English writing. So actually, when you have the fixed title, the first sentence of the abstract just a uh, refresh of the title. And then the first sentence of summary, just another refresh of the title. 
because um, ideally they are talking about the same things. And usually when we try to write the papers, we will try to find out the, what the three main contribution come from this uh, paper. What are the three main key points? And in this paper, it's very, this is paper is written uh, not by the Asia, it's written by the native speaker. So the style they use is really good example. So for example, they have the three conclusion. The first one, this one is the first conclusion. And then the second one, this one is the second conclusion. And the third one is the third conclusion. So that's the three different uh, things that uh, they uh, this also want to highlight. They think this is a major key point here. So usually this also uh, give us some hint that when we try to write the paper, just think about the, what are the three main contribution of this one and make as a list, as a bullet point. And then once you have a bullet point as a list, just that would be highly uh, helpful for you to uh, write this paper. So we have three conclusions. And this is mentioned in the abstract and as the same. All this will be re-mentioned again in the conclusion. So this sentence are exactly the same like this one. And this one are exactly the same like this one. And this one are exactly like the same like this one. So you can see that uh, it's already the two paragraph. So if you, this is like an IEEE electron device later, usually the page is less than uh, three pages. And then based on the refresh of the title and then highlight the three conclusion, you already finished the abstract and summary, right? So there's uh, nothing difficult for writing a paper because basically the idea, the logic is will be you mention the highlight in the abstract, you re-mention again in the summary, and then the rest of it just uh, put some figure and text to prove that what you say. For example, you put some IDVG curve, you put some description, you put some modeling to say that uh, what's, uh, uh, why you think that uh, your, your statement is uh, crucial. Okay, so this is... Uh, some more about the, the, the detail of the paper. So you can see it's already mentioned. This is how we already described the different breaking style of the Miller index means something different. So in here, he tried to measure the 110 versus 110. That's a two different of a bracket. And this is one, this is, this is. So as you say, but as you see, as long as you get an understanding of the, the Miller index, that uh, now would be not difficult for you to understand this paper. And this is described for the whole mobility, and this is described, described for the electron mobility. So in this one, in this paper, they actually is quite nice that uh, they found out that might not everyone still remember the concept of Miller index. So they also make the small remark to remind everyone. The 110 here are also shown for current flow in the perpendicular direction. So the current flow, this is the direction. So they just remind you that the, the two different style of bracket, one indicates a plan, another one is indicate as a direction. So that's exactly that the how that the textbook tell us. Okay, so one more is that uh, since we are everyone here who already the graduate school student or who is going to be the graduate students in the future. So then just want to share that uh, especially for the some of you are under student here, I know, so uh, may not use the Google Scholar very often, but for graduate student, I think it's pretty common. Uh, therefore, usually when we try to uh, Google certain of the literature, the only search engine recommended is Google Scholar. So you don't have to waste the other time, use the other engine. The Google Scholar is already powerful enough 
to help to find you the all of your literature that you wanted. Okay, so this is what we have for the this uh uh, uh chapter for the about the materials introduction and the crystal structure of the solids. Okay, so then we'll move on. We we'll move on to the quantum mechanics here. So we are going to discuss uh, the why do we need to learn about the quantum mechanics and how actually the semiconductor analysis need to this of the quantum mechanics here. So we can back to the typical uh, understanding, like the case that uh, in the typical MOSFET. So in the typical MOSFET, we have already discussed the structure for the MOSFET is like this one. We have the source. We have, so this is our source. This is our drain. And then we have the P-type of substrate here. And then on top of the MOSFET, we will put the dielectric. We will have the dielectric. And then the most often used dielectric is the silicon dioxide. And then on top of silicon dielectric, dielectric we have the gate metal. Okay, so as we already briefly explained the operation principle for the MOSFET. So idea case is that uh, we will apply the gate bias. We put a substrate source, sorry, we put the source as a grounded. We put the drain voltage as a small, for example, one volt here. And we apply the gate bias. Once we apply gate bias, we will start to create the electrons here, right? Because of you have the gate uh, positive bias, for sure you will start to attract some of the negative charge that will become of the electron here. And since we also apply the drain bias from the right hand side, so all this negative charge will be flow here. So therefore, you will see the electron flow from the uh, source to drain. And this one will become the drain current. And therefore, if you look at for the most important curve here, so if you look at for the typical IDVG curve here, we will find out after a certain moment you gave, uh, when you get bias is large enough, that means you already start to create some of the electron here. Then you will start to have the drain current flow out from the drain side. So that's a electron current and then it's a opposite compared to the typical current, the direction just the opposite way for the uh, electron current here. And then in this case, we actually make the certain of the assumption. What the assumption is that uh, our dielectric is so good, it's uh, so perfect of the insulator. That means when we apply the gate voltage, all these electrons here will only sit in here, will have no chance to go up because this is how the dielectric met, right? This is how we need the dielectric. Dielectric is an insulating material. That suppose there's no actually any carrier can flow. This dielectric uh, is a So, carrier So, that's how we actually need of this dielectric here. So, you won't have the chance this electron should have no chance to flow up because of the dielectric is too perfect. And therefore, based on this concept, if you still try to measure of your gate current, that's supposed to be equal to zero, right? Because of dielectric, dielectric just like the wall. So it's supposed that there's no possible any object can transport to the wall. Can there's a means that the 
ideal case, the gate current should be zero. But however, if you really use a certain of the equipment to measure your semiconductor, then you try to plug in. This is gate current IG versus VG. You will find it now. It's never happened to be zero. It's always there's a certain current will flow. And this current flow will also increase when we give the gate bias. And that's actually the problem that typical classical physics cannot explain. That's a problem that the Newton physics cannot explain. So if we use IGVG to uh这个杂集其实还是会有一些电流不管它多小它可能是十的负十二十的负十三或十的负十四安培但它终究就是有电流那终究有电流量就代表说它其实还是会有 so that's why we need to have the quantum mechanics because uh, classical Newton physics can help to understand why the carrier can transport over the dielectric reach to the another side. So that's why we need to use uh, quantum mechanics. So the quantum mechanics idea is that uh, if you consider a wall. This is just a wall. This is not a dielectric, just a wall. Chang B. And then if you throw a ball to toward the wall, based on the classical physics. There's only one thing can be happen. That the ball will rebound. That's only can be happen based on the typical physics. And there's no chance you will find the ball on the other side. No matter how uh the uh how fast the ball can uh, can be thrown, there's no chance that the ball can be uh go through the wall and transport into another side. But if you look at for the quantum mechanics, what the quantum mechanics is telling us, still the same, we have the wall here. But now we are discussing that there's a ball called the electrons. And the electron is moving into the wall. And we found out that for sure, there are still certain electrons will bounce back. But the difference is that uh, there will be a certain electrons will be able to transport and then go through the wall and then reach to the another side. And that's why we need to have the quantum mechanics to help us to understand Because of the classic physics cannot understand, only the quantum mechanics can tell us. So because of the carrier can reach to the another side. So that's why your gauge current actually will larger than zero. And then when you gate bias is larger, that means you try to speed up your carrier and then that means more carrier will be able to uh, transport the, the wall and reach to the another side. But based on the classical physics here, this will be equal to zero because the ball cannot uh, uh, across the, the wall here. And then to be precise, what we discuss the wall here is actually what we call the barrier. Uh, so that's a, that's a point that we need to learn the quantum mechanics because of the the class classical phases cannot help to understand certain of the phenomena in our transistor. And the quantum mechanics is a kind of like a whole book. So if you uh, have certainly follow 
the maybe the other professor who have ever lectured quantum mechanics, sometimes it can be a the 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 class that can be long for the one semester. But uh, to be honest, I don't believe that everything there will be needed for us, because for the semiconductor people, we only need to understand a small portion of the quantum mechanics. That's already enough for us. Uh, for the engineering, for the semiconductor engineering. So in this class, we will use uh, one chapter to briefly explain the quantum mechanics. And I believe the knowledge we shown here is already enough for us. And then, which means that uh, you don't feel afraid about the quantum mechanics because we won't give you too much that actually uh, give you too much burden on this one. Okay. So that's already the certain of a conclusion that what we're going to go through for this chapter. Let's go more some detail. Why do we need quantum physics? So because we actually want to have these physics to describe the electrons movement in a micro world. So because we now describe the, 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 this kind of carrier in the very small, small world, so we need to have the quantum effect physics. So if you consider it is a large object, and then usually the Newton, Newton's mechanics works pretty well. This is because of the, the Newton physics can explain in the many in the large object. But in the case of the small world, especially down to below like the micron, then the Newton physics actually can, cannot help us anymore. So imagine you have the problem. The problem is that you have the one semiconductor material. This is your semiconductor material. This is your semiconductor. And then now you are interested in the one electron flow inside of the semiconductor. Then we have to come again to think about that the semiconductor is a structure contains many, many periodic atoms, And therefore, the problem for the electrons movement in the semiconductor actually is exactly the same of the problem of you have the electrons move. You have electron move in the periodic structure. So this is a periodic structure. So this is our uh, periodic structure. And then we are actually discussing you have the electron. Moving in the periodic structure. So now we can simplify our questions. So ideally, we are considering the electron movement in the semiconductor material, but we get into the close, get into the detail. Actually, the problem is that we are considering the electron moving in the periodic structure. Once you consider periodic structure, then you have to come to the concept of the electron potential. You have to concept about the potential because of the each Atoms actually will have the difference of the potential. So when the electron more close to here, the potential will be definitely different than the electron moving in the free space. Then again, we can another to simplify the problem of this one to the electron in the periodic potential. So previously, it's the electrons in the periodic st structure but for the further, actually just uh, 
periodic potential. And this is a problem that we want to solve. So imagine you have the potential So this is periodic potential. And therefore, once you have an electron move here, and move here, and or move here, that gives us a difference of the case. And that's why we will use a quantum physics here. So again, now we simplify, and then we further interpret for our question. Original question is electron movement in the semiconductor material. But semiconductor material is just a, a type of the periodic structure with the many, many atoms. So now the question is become the electron movement in the periodic structure. But the periodic atoms actually itself has a different potential. And therefore, the problem can be further interpreted as electron movement in the potential, different periodic potential, and then the we are curious like how electron movement in here, how electron movement in here, and how electron movement in here. So that's exactly the problem that we want to solve. So once we, before we consider for the principles of the quantum mechanics, and there are the three other principles that we need to first remind everyone. These all are already you have learned from high school or for the modern physics. The first one is the principle of the energy quantum. And the second one is the wave particle duality principle. And the third one is uncertainty principle. So I believe that the, these are the, all the phases that you already have learned. Even if you don't remember, it's fine. We actually don't really need too much detail of, of this one. We need this one to give us a certain of the assumption that we can further elaborate. So just a quick reminder, what's a, some basic of a modern physics? For example, in the modern physics, we already have learned what's a photoelectric effect. So that's demonstrate inconsistency between the experimental result and the classic, classical theory of the light here. So according to the Classical physics, if the intensity of light is large enough, then the work function of the material will be overcome and an electron will be emitted from a surface independent of the, this is based on the, uh, independent of the frequency. So that's how the, the, the uh, uh, classical physics tell us. For myself, I even don't remember. I'm, I'm not saying to remember. I didn't know, don't memorize of this series. Just uh, this is a quick overlook for the some physics fundamental. And then I don't think that's uh, so difficult, but at least you can uh, uh, quickly uh, review. And, but the observed effect is that uh, at a constant incident intensity, the maximum kinetic energy of the photon electron varies linearly with the frequency. So there's a frequency dependency. And with a limited frequency. Below this frequency, there's no photon electrons uh, produced here. So based on the photo electron effect, you have the incident of the light here, and then you have a photoelectron can be created. And then 
it needs a certain of the minima. So that means this is a frequency. And beyond the certain of frequency, you can start to generate the photoelectrons here. So that's how the, the photon electrons, a uh, photo photoelectric effect tells us. So this is a maximum kin uh, kinetic energy. Okay, so that's uh, some of the basic. And then we also need to have a little bit understand of the energy quantum, this kind of the concept. So the Planck makes some assumption in the 1900 about the thermal radiation emitted from the heat surface in a discrete package of the energy. So that's how we call this as a quantum. So the energy of this quantum is given by E equal to H mu. Where the V is the velocity, frequency of velocity, and H is a typical what we call the Planck constant. So I think that everyone is more or less familiar with, or at least heard about this equation before. And in the 19... Five years later, 1905, Einstein interpreted the photoelectric result by suggesting that energy in the light wave is also contained in the discrete package of the bundles here. And this party-like packet of the energy is also called the photon. which energy is also given by E equal to H mu. So the photoelectric will e explain how the discrete nature of the photon and demonstrate the particle-like behavior of the photon. So basically, the, the, how the, the, all these uh, giant genius scientists want to tell us that the light can be considered as a particle. That's how, especially in the case of the the electrons, that's how the general conclusion here. So then we can have this one equation show me here. So we won't go to this detail, just quickly show it. And then this is a phi is a minimal energy of a work function required to remove the electron from the surface. So that's a very famous of the uh, uh, equation to describe this effect. And next one is star have the wave particle duality. So that's a, a to uh, idea is the photon is both can be considered as a wave and also can be considered as a particle. But how about for the electron? So then based on the what the previous is already proved that the, the photon is either wave or particle. But then the question will be the electrons. So the Compton effect, the party-like behavior of the electromagnetic, so which means when we consider the density pole electromagnetic, that's also the party-like, the particle-like, the, the uh, xiang li zi xing wei, the particle-like behavior. So in 1924, uh, uh, the boy make also assumption that the there's the existence of the matter wave, the Wu Zi Po. So he suggests that the since wave existed, particle-like behavior, particles should be expected to show the wave-like uh, property. So in general, what he said that the uh, Li Zi and uh, Po, they, they both possible to uh, uh, have this kind of the phenomenon. And the hypothesis of this the boy was existence of what we call the wave particle duality principle.
So that's why we can start to writing down of this uh, equation that uh, the wavelength of particle can be expressed by this equation. Okay, so the last one, just uh, last one about the modern phase is uh, uncertainty principle. The Hessenberg uncertainty principle provided in the 1927 also apply primarily to the very small particle and state that we cannot describe. with uh, absolute accuracy that behavior of least subatomic particle so what he says is that when we consider the uh, very small particle that uh, we are not able to exactly identify the accuracy here so that's uh, how he calls this is a uh, uh, uncertain principle so uncertainty principle describes a fundamental relationship between the sum of the variable, including the position of momentum and also energy and time here. So again, this only quickly show that uh, for this equation, and we won't spend again too much time on this. But this uncertain principle in later on have a certain of the suggestion for us is that when we consider the electrons or carrier, we also cannot accurate, we cannot uh, accurately to estimate how among of the electron and carriers, we can only estimate as a probability. So probability is a way to describe the electron's behavior because of uh, we are not able to have the absolute accuracy. So that's a further implication for our semiconductor uh, people that have come from uh, based on the uncertainty principles. Okay, so then later on we will start to talk about the different case and how the electron movement in this different periodical state uh, structure. And we will take a break, we'll come back later.
Okay, so we will continue. And then uh, uh, since that, uh, all of the students has been finalized for this class, so there's no, I believe that the, the enrollment is uh, finished. So it's good time to check everyone. And also I can know at least uh, the uh, see you, understand a little bit more about you. So we will check the name list. And in our class this semester, we have a total of the enrolled student, we have a 69, and then some of them is considered as an audition student, so they are not in the, uh, 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 the list that I will check. But uh, most of the students from this class that come from the, the ICST, mm -hmm. and also the Qianzhanban Li Yisuo. So these are the two majority group of this student. And there are the students also come from the uh, very nice, also as I say, the very disciplined, uh, come from a uh, uh, different background. For example, we have a student from the Tumu, we have a student from the uh, Inhua, chemi applied chemistry, we also have a student from the material science department, we have a student from uh, mechanical engineering, biomedical, uh, also there are some student, under student, mm -hmm. So the undergraduate student, we have the still from the Naimi Ban and also from Jixie Xi, from Dian Ji Xi and Dian Wu Xi. And also we have student, actually it's uh, for the audition student, we have a student from the uh, Guangke and uh, uh, Qi Guan. So that's good. Good to know that everyone uh, from the different programs is interested. So now I will call your name. So now I can uh, at least to recognize your face. Do my best to recognize your face. Uh, Xun Jinghua. Okay. Zhu Tingyi. Okay. Li Guangling. <laughs> Li Yentong. Okay. Yang Yinjia. Okay. Wang Songchun. Okay. Zhuang Jiahao. Okay. Cai Zijie. Cai He Li, OK. Cai Yu Zhe, Xie Chen You, OK. Zheng Jun Yang, Chen Shi Jie, Chen Yan Li, Chen Qi Yu, OK. 黃威成黃伯君 uh, We have the two international students Shivandra Maybe still in the quarantine Sivan Sen Okay 彭立奇 Okay 庄玉婷 OK 叶刚里 OK 谢嘉恩 OK 陈乃明 宝伯亨, OK 刘家伟 OK 吴天心 Hello 李伟立 Hello 李子恒 OK 卢玉伟 OK 谢承轩 曾伯燕, 江炳燕, 何西荣, Hello 蔡明俊, 邱凯恩, 陈玉汉 OK 
，郭美妍 ，OK， 冯艺婷 ，OK， 王威志 ，OK， 李柔君 ，OK， 吴怡峰 ，OK， 蔡林喜，蔡玉喜。蔡玉喜、蔡玲喜，啊、呃，傅世轩、张景瑜 ，OK， 石景祥 ，OK， 蔡志轩、邓雨欣 ，OK， 陈应桥、尹心柔 ，OK。杨成瑜 ，Hello， 赖义环，哦，赖义玄 ，OK， 陈子琪 ，Hello， 刘景耀 ，Hello， 唐贤忠，许云轩 ，Hello。谢月恩，谢月恩，谢月聪，蔡梦哲 ，OK， 陈瑞乾，乾，刘允仲，好了，何建伟 ，OK。沈俊宇 ，Hello， 洪承义 ，Hello， 吴浩洋 ，Hello， 孙子涵，李佑俊 ，Hello， 李玉婷 ，Hello， 李维渊 ，Hello， 蔡明浩。OK， 好。OK， so we will continue， and then there's a sound of the， a、uh, mistake， that the thanks the student to point it out， so that should be this one， should be。This so rather than the, uh, the one that uh, we show. And also, from the. This one, there should be no. The, so in this case, we won't have the negative here. So once we add a small head, so we don't have the negative. And some of the students have asked me about uh sometimes that uh, uh, I will put this in the source strand as I say this is n plus this is n plus the plus here is means a higher concentration and regarding to how high is actually the reference the comparison between the n so usually we will have the certain some of the definition like n, n plus or n minus. So the major uh, uh, difference is just the concentration of n plus is larger than n, larger than n minus. Sometimes we even for a certain case we will put what we call n plus plus. So there is no specific rule that the how, how do we quantify this the plus or plus plus just the it just uh, 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 gave us uh, some certain of the concept that uh, there's a concentration difference between the different regions. So if the region we put the N and then there's another region put the N plus, just want to tell that uh, there's uh, the concentration difference and some part is a uh, highly doping and some part is uh, a lightly doping region. And sometimes we even have N minus minus. That's all can be possible, but uh, the maximum is a two. 
So we don't have the three plus or three minus. So the max map we use is only the two plus or the two minus here. So that's a typical uh, uh, we, the notation that we will use. Okay, so let's back to the uh, quantum mechanics. The purpose is to try to understand the electron movement here. So we consider the periodic structure here. So we have the electrons, and then once the electron is moving across this crystal here, so the electron in free space. And this one, when we consider the case that uh, this is our potential, periodic potential, but uh, we are consider the electron is moving far away from the periodic potential. So that actually is considering electrons in free space. So in the case of the first one, we will be actually, uh, if you consider the electron movement in this periodic, there will be the three different cases. One is electron movement in the free space. And second is electron move inside, really inside into the potential wall, or a little bit shallow, close to the surface. So we will discuss the each case. The first one is electron in free space. So in the case of free space, So this is our energy. And then in the free space, this one. So in the free space, we consider our potential barrier. This one, ux is equal to zero. So if our potential here is zero, and that means the electrons in the free space is actually moving in the free space. So electron can be moved in this direction or in these directions. So that's the first uh, case that we want to discuss. And then the second one, which will be the infinite potential well here. So that means if the electron here inside the infinite so in this case will be equal to This is x equal to 0, and this is x equal to a. So we have uh, three regions. Region 1, region 2 and region three. And the electrons is in the region two. But however, the region one and region three is infinite potential well. So that means this one is approach to the infinity. So we are curious that if there is a one electron moving inside of this potential well, and then the this one and this one is approached to the infinity, and how actually the electron movement can be happen inside of this potential well. So that's the second case. And then the third case is that if the electron is moving 
phase a state potential function. So we have a region one and region two. And then if there's a state potential function, here, and then with the potential V0. And now if we have an incident, we have the electrons, we have the electrons movement in this direction. And that will be what happened. So that's a, we are curious that there is a, a move, electron movement and then phase a state potential function. So that will be the the uh, third case. Okay, the last case is getting more realistic. So if the potential barrier is limited, it's not a uh, state function, it's neither state function nor the infinite potential well. So if we have the case, like here. So this is the Vx at the place x equal to 0 and x equal to a. And we have the potential barrier. It's between the x equal to 0 and x equal to a. So then in this case, we still have a three region. Region 1. region 2 and region 3 so we still have a three region so if we have the one electrons still trying to move in these directions so then what happened in the three regions here so that's uh, how we curious and then the electron with the energy smaller than our potential barrier. So this is our potential barrier here, is a V0. So if our energy is smaller than the V0, and what the, actually the, this movement will happen. And the last case is exactly trying to understand for the, the, the question that we already raised in the beginning. So still, Remember, our question is, if we have the MOSFET here, and we have the dielectric, and we have the gate, so that's a VG. So previously already mentioned, our question is, how do we understand if we apply the gate bias, this electron can or cannot across this barrier? So that's our ultimate question we want to understand. And then this question will be very similar to the question of here as well, because in this case, the electrons just here and then we have a region 2 there's a potential barrier which is equal to this one our dielectric and then we are curious that the, what actually that happened in this region because the region here will be leading to the result of our gate energy current here so the last question will be trying to help us to understand the real case in the MOSFET. In the real case of MOSFET. Okay, so let's go uh, one by one. First of all, still have to back to the uh, equation. We you use the equation as a beginning, try to understand the physics. So still 
don't feel overwhelmed by this equation because the mathematics is just a tool. The purpose of the mathematics is to understand the physics behind. So first, we will consider this time uh, independent Schrodinger equation. So the one-dimensional non-related Schrodinger waves equation is shown in here. This is typical the wave equation here. The wave equation considers a wave function. This one is a wave function with the dependency of the x and t. x is a space, t is a time. So the one-dimensional Schrodinger's wave equation considering the uh, dependency of the x and t. And then the vx is a potential function. And then now we can assume the wave function can be written in the form of this is our wave function can be written in the form with uh, uh, this one with a function of the x and then with a function of the the t so that's uh, phi x is function of the position x and then phi t is a function of the time t only so we can make this uh, uh, assumption here so once we put in this one and then therefore the equation in the end will become in this way and then also we can consider the phi t can be expressed by this one so therefore in the end phi t will be simplified as shown me here so finally we have this equation will be equal to our e and then we can start to have a time independent function so second order of the phi x second derivative of the phi x plus n h 1 minus v x so this is the most important is from this equation there's no correlation with the t anymore so there's no correlation with the time anymore so then this is a time independent So don't worry about to try to derive this equation. So this is just a very typical case that they look at the every textbook is always starting from this. But the most important is the last equation that uh, finally we are, can have the equation with only the x correlation and there's no correlation with the time. So that's a time independent. So the physical meaning of the wave function. So phi x t the wave function is to describe describe the behavior of an electron in crystal. So that's a wave function. The purpose is that when we try to define wave function, is try to understand the behavior of electron in the crystal. And this one can generally can be expressed, as we say, for the x function only with a time function only. And then previously we have shown this one can be also considered in this case. And this one will be equal to. So, uh, the reason why we define this phi t as showing here and become here is sometimes you can, uh, if you look at some certain of the modern physics, they have a more explanation. But the, for me, will be look like is mainly related to the mathematics trick. 
So we try to simplify this equation with a certain of the considering mathematics because later on this mathematic trick can give us a certain of the advantage. So therefore, if you put this equation become like this one, so you have 5xt times 5 star xt. And as you know from the, uh, I think it's a complex uh, uh, variable, full bit. So sometimes we will already learn that the, the star here, it means that you put this as a star and this becomes a positive. So therefore, this equation in the end will be equal to this one because of this and this can actually once it times together that will be disappear so this times this will be disappear and then the equation itself doesn't uh, bring us too many information the most important is the physics behind the physics behind is telling us now the previous one for the wave function is a uh, location dependency and also the time dependency but now we play this mathematic trick right now we only have the location dependent only location dependent only here so therefore from this equation in the end will be equal to this one so that means that this is a probability density function and is independent of the time so that means that when we consider the wave equation in the end we can simplify as a case is only considering the probability so again reminder for the case that we want to understand is if we have the barrier here and then if we have the electron then we found out that the, the electrons appears on the other side is related to the probability it's just matter of the probability and then cannot be an uh, accurate determinant it's just a matter with the probability so no matter how low the chance can be happened there's still the certain of the probability will be uh, that the, the electron can uh, across this barrier and then appears in the, on the other side so that's an important conclusion from the wave function so here is uh, some short uh, uh, summary for the wave equation so wave equation provides uh, uh, what we call the wave mechanics that's uh, based on the principle of the quantum and then wave particle duality and also let's uh, follow the laws of conserva conservation of energy so then the most conclusion is this one so the wave function is a probability density function is independent of the time so that's where how we already mentioned before the major difference between the classical quantum me uh, mechanics is that in the classical mechanics in the classical mechanics the position of the particle or body can be determined precisely so that's uh, how we already say that uh, in the typical case that uh, we should be able to determine the particle and body precisely but uh, in the case of the quantum mechanics the position of the particle is found in terms of the probability so the concept of probability here is very important probability is something that for the uh, you everyone here has a different background but if you are come from the more related to the electrical engineering that usually we won't use the probability concept very often before uh, of course if you are working in the center of the communication they need to use uh, 
probability, but uh, is uh, related to the hardware, like the uh, circuit design or the solid state. Certain of these things, we won't have the concept of probability very often. But uh, actually, when we try to understand the electron behavior, it's important to have to keep in mind that uh, it's always related to a probability. Okay, so now based on the wave equation, once in the future we were going to solve the wave equation, and before we solve, we need to clearly define the boundary condition. So as you may know, the, the boundary condition is a, a critical to solve the certain of the equation. So the boundary condition will be the first one. This one represented a probability density of function. That means if you do the integration for the full range, for the full space, then the probability will be equal to 1, right? So that's a 100%, so that's a 1. So the probability, if you do the full integration, that should be equal to 1. So that's the first uh, uh, prob uh, boundary condition. And the wave function is first derivative must have the follow property if the total energy and potential are finite everywhere. So the first one is a dv partial phi x over partial x must be finite, single value, and continuous. And second one is this one also must be finite. So based on this one, so we can have the uh, uh, boundary conditions that allow us to later to solve the wave equation in the different cases. So, the this is a figure. This is two possible uh, example of potential function and the corresponding wave uh, solution here. So the case A, this is potential function is finite everywhere, and then the wave function as well as the derivative is continuous. So that means this one must be continuous here. And the second case is this one. And that's uh, the potential function is in here is equal to uh, zero here. And then because of we have the uh, infinite potential well in this region. Okay, so we have all the tools we needed. So finally, we can start to move on to see that uh, how we can use all this wave equation to help us to solve the, the questions. The first one is electron in the free space. So in this case, the energy and potential is constant and so now we back to this time independent Schrodinger waves equation and because of this is a free space that means this is equal to zero because there is no barrier this is here the barrier is here it is zero It's because there's no barrier, so we assume V equal to zero. Then we can start to further derive this equation. And then the general solution for this equation is this one. This is something that you learn from engineering mathematics. In the case of engineering mathematics, it already teach us why this equation have this certain of the solution look like in this way. So basically based on this uh, solution, and then we consider the, the time dependent portion of the solution here. So we consider this one. So finally, our full wave equation, phi consider x and t, which is equal to phi x, phi t, 
which will be equal 5x exponential minus j wt and then we can put this one here so that's a uh, uh, the uh, solution for this wave equation function so in the end you can have this one so because of you put this minus j omega t this is positive j k x so you can have this one and this one will be have this one so that's a, a typical mathematic calculation and for sure it's important to understand the physics rather than just uh, this equation so the physics here is the first term with a coefficient of the a is a wave traveling in the x direction and then the second term which will be a wave traveling with a negative x direction So although the calculation is uh, complicated and then the equation looks quite uh, difficult and then we made uh, several uh, not straightforward uh, uh, assumption but uh, I think the conclusion here is very easily understood because this is free space so whatever you have a carry here for sure can be easily travel in the x or travel in the y so that's actually it's a phenomenon that everyone must able to accept because it's a pretty common sense that you have a carrier in the free space for sure you can travel here or can travel here without any limitation so as i say the equation is equation although it looks tough but in the end usually the conclusion is very simple the conclusion just proves that the free space the carrier can free in the x and can be free in the y uh, neg and negative x direction as well okay so once we consider wave number this is based on wave particle duality so we can still get this one but uh, the most important is finally in the free space the electron can free go everywhere okay in the second case that's we consider for the infinite potential well so in the potential well is considering the particle is assumed to exist in region 2 in region 2 so the particle is contained with a finite region of the space so therefore this is region 2 in the region 2 so we are curious at how that the electrons movement in the region 2 and then back to this equation in the region 2 the vx equal to 0 so this is vx equal to 0 here and then we can have this equation come up and then of course the particular solution of this uh, equation is written in here we consider the cosine and sine so this is also the uh, the knowledge that come from the engineering mathematics so if you don't understand you can go back to check but the most important is if we consider the boundary condition since this is infinite so that means that the the, the wave function in this region in this region must be equal to zero so the phi x phi in the x equal to zero and then the phi in the x equal to a must be equal to zero so the boundary condition also quite a uh, uh, makes sense right because in here this is infinite so that should be this one is equal to zero and this one is equal to zero and therefore we can solve this equation with getting the result here and in the end the phi x is become like in this way and this is how we define this as a standing wave Zhupo. so i think from high school physics already learned the concept of the Zhupo.
So that's a standing wave here. So again, if you have the electron here, and then the electron inside of this potential well will form in as a standing wave, as a typical, like the other phases also have the same concept, like a standing wave as well. So, uh, the most important concept when we consider the, the infinite potential well is trying to have the quantization of the energy. So again, this is our solution. Once we consider the wave number, we can put out our wave number with uh, the, the energy. And therefore, we found out that the, the energy here is a, can be the different part of the the we change the n number, then we actually have the difference of the energy here. So that means if in the case of the E1 is equal to two and then if we have the E2, so that's actually the concept of the quanta. So therefore, we found out that with inside of the potential well, actually, we have the quantization of the energy. Quantization of energy. So the energy of a particle is quantized here. The energy of a particle is quantized, therefore the energy of a particle can only have particular discrete value. So that's how we actually try to consider the energy right now is not a continuous value, it's a discrete value and we have the concept of the quantization. Okay, the third one is getting even close to our real case, is that we consider the state function. So in this case of state function, we consider a flux of particle. is incident on the particular uh, potential barrier. So like as shown here, so you have an incident particle and then try to incident on the potential barrier. And in the region one, as usual, region one, the Vx is equal to zero. So now we need to solve the wave, wave equation in the region 1 and the region 2. So the region 1, as usual, the Vx is equal to 0, and then we back to this original case. And also, based on this case, we already uh, uh, derived before that we can solve this one, consider the, the wave in the positive x direction and also the negative x direction. So this is... Uh, the traveling wave in the positive x direction that represents the incident wave. And then, of course, this one, just an uh, opposite, just uh, a traveling wave.
in the next uh, negative x direction. So I think the conclusion here is also very straightforward. It's just very similar to the case of free space. This is actually the free space. So once you have the incident of the electrons here, you can have either positive or either negative direction. That can be both possible, right? So that's, a, again, the equation looks scary, but the conclusion is very simple. That just want to describe that uh, now your particle in the region one can travel in just like the free space, that you have a traveling wave in the positive x direction, also the traveling wave in the next active direction as well. Okay, so now we are, we are all not only discussed for the region one, but also in the case of region two. So this is region two. In the case of region two, the potential V is equal to V zero. So in the region two, the potential V equal to V zero. Now, again, we have to replace this as a V zero. But we will make a one small assumption that assume our energy is smaller than V0. Therefore, you get this one, V0 minus E, because of the energy is smaller than our V0 here. So again, we can have these two solutions come out. So based on the 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 wave function in the phi 2x must be remain finite. So the wave function must be finite. So therefore, this must be equal to zero. Otherwise, this will approach to the infinity because this is exponential positive x. So therefore, the b2 must be zero here. So we have the finally, in the case of the phi 2, in the region 2, we have this wave equation. And then, so now we solve for the region 1, we solve for the region 2. Here is a summary of the solution. In the region 1, it's shown me here. The region 2 is shown me here. And the boundary condition is at x equal to 0 must be continuous. So this one must be equal, the phi 1 0 must be equal to phi 2 0. And also, the potential function is everywhere finite. So therefore, this also need to be equal, continuous as well. So based on these two boundary conditions, we can get the B1 and B2 as shown me here. And this gives us certain of the interesting uh, observation because of the the flux the flux of incident particle is shown me here, and then we can consider the one of the reflecting particles here. So then we can derive for the reflection of the coefficient r. So now the conclusion is still. I believe it's straightforward. You have the electron incident in this direction. For sure, you definitely will have the particle reflect. So this is a reflection. So that's a pretty fitted with a classical physics, right? So based on this, this coefficient of the reflection coefficient, the resolve r equal to 1 implies that all of the particle incident on the potential barrier are eventually completely reflected. So if we have r equal to 1, it means that you incident for the 10 particle here, you got a 10 particle bounce back. So that's con consistent with the classical phasing. This is already we learned from the Newton phases that the we throw the ball against the wall, and then the ball will only happen to reflect back. So that's exactly the case we are talking about. 
However, for sure that based on quantum mechanics, there's a certain point that uh, we need to further uh, elaborate here. It's uh, in the region two. So in the region two, we found out that for the case of the E smaller than zero, actually the A2 is not zero. The coefficient of A2 is not zero. And that means if A2 is not zero, that means we actually have a certain wave function existing in this region. We have a certain of the particle existing in this region. So if A2 is not zero, then the probability density function of the particle can be found in the region two is not equal to zero as well. So that means although there is a barrier here, then we still existed our particle. The particle incident here, the first is there's a certain of the bounce back, but also the particle can be further existed in here, inside of this barrier here. And because of the wave function is not equal to zero. This result implies that there is a finite probability probability that incident particle will penetrate a potential barrier and exist in the region two. So that means our particle can penetrate the barrier and exist in the region two. So that's a super important conclusion because this cannot be understood from the classical physics. And finally, based on the quantum mechanics, we got the conclusion that the particle here can penetrate Tronto in this barrier and even exist in the region too. The probability of particle penetrate the potential barriers is another difference between the classical and the quantum mechanics. So that's a class, uh, another difference, as I say, that the uh, the classical physics cannot explain these things. So this, based on this case, and then this case actually telling us, if you back to the typical MOSFET again, we have the source and drain. We have a dielectric. And on top of dielectric, we have a gate. So once you apply the party gate bias, you will have the electron start to incident, right? And this telling us that there's a certain of electrons exist in the dielectric. Even the dielectric is completely insulated, and then based on the quantum mechanics, tell us that the, the electron is possibly existing in the dielectric itself. It just matter with the probability. The probability can be low, but anyway, that still can be possible happen. So that's a important uh, uh, relation correlation that the. Uh, 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 from the quantum mechanics trying to telling us. Okay, so we probably will stop here for today because of uh, the next week we will discuss uh, the, in the case with the potential barrier and in the end for the tunneling. So you can see the last case, just a combination of all three cases. Right now we have the limited barrier, so for sure, even we don't start to do anything derived, the conclusion can be easily guessed that you have electron inject. First, you have a bounce back, and then electron can be exist in the region two, in the end, further existing in the region three. And that's how we call this as a tunneling. So that's exactly why we will have the gate recurrent. Okay, 
So we will stop here. So uh, see you guys uh, next week. And then I already upload the homework. So please check for the E3. And then uh, the deadline is two weeks later. And then you need to uh, uh, do your homework in the paper and then hang, hang over for the paper. And if you have any question, just feel free to let me know. Okay, thank you.